Get it? Anyway, this is question and answer time with Adam Neely. I'm here answering all of your questions about bass and music in general. So let's get started. The great Benzoni writes, It's so weird seeing Adam with hair. Yeah, it is a little weird, isn't it? Uh, my New Year's resolution was to have hair, and so far, I am succeeding. Alex Santini writes, Hi Adam, can you explain why a power chord sound me like a major chord despite hasn't a third? So that's a good question, and the reason is because the major third features prominently in the overtone series. If you take a root fifth octave power chord on a guitar and add distortion to it, what you're doing is you're adding upper harmonic content to the basic fundamental sound. So I can demonstrate this with a synthesizer. Every time that I add a harmonic to a sine wave, or in other words, a multiple of the fundamental, it sounds like I'm adding more and more notes to kind of like a chord, but it also starts sounding more and more like it's harmonic harmonic distortion, like a guitar chord. And this is basically at the core of what distortion is. You're adding more notes on top of a fundamental. This is why even though technically speaking, yeah, you just have the root, the fifth, and the octave, you'll still be hearing that major third quite prominently because it is literally there. The more distortion you add, the more prominent the major third will be in the actual sound. So there we have it. It sounds major because of the harmonic series. Thank you for your question. Joanne Mitchell writes, For the next Q&A, Hello Adam, how are you? I hope you are doing well in life as well as music. My question is, have you ever forced yourself to listen to specific genres you didn't like to become a better musician? Does it help with creativity getting out of the comfort zone of genres you do like? Well yeah, I think it can be useful, but I don't think it's necessarily important that you like everything, but I think it's important to understand why you like certain things and why you dislike others. Understanding your emotional reaction to consuming a piece of art or consuming a piece of music can be very useful in understanding yourself. So, for example, if you don't like the sound of modern pop music, which is a lot of people, honestly, uh, it's important to figure out why you don't like the sound of modern pop music. Is it the overproduction? Is it the auto-tuned vocals? Is it the cheap and trite lyrics? Why do you not like something? Is it everything? Maybe it's everything. Figuring out why you don't like modern pop music can help you focus in on the things that you do want to do with your own music making. So, if overproduction just really makes you feel like, oh God, this is, this is not music, this is terrible, maybe you need to focus in on lo-fi music and raw, aggressive sounds and distortion distorted vocals and things that are kind of the antithesis of modern pop music. But maybe that isn't your jam. Maybe you don't like the lo-fi sound, and maybe the reason why you don't like modern pop music is because of the trite lyrics. So maybe you need to focus in on much more poetic and much more meaningful lyric writing and songwriting. This is the benefit of critical thought and critical listening. You're trying to figure out what something is. You know your reaction to it, you don't like it, but you don't necessarily know what it is just yet. Through the process of figuring out exactly what it is, you're learning a lot more about yourself and learning a lot more about your reaction to music. This is the interesting thing about music theory and music analysis for me. It's a tool for me to learn more about me. Yes, that is somewhat narcissistic and selfish, but art to me, at the core of it, is a fairly selfish endeavor. It's saying everything that I do matters enough for you to care about it. How are you gonna create anything that matters to somebody else if it doesn't matter a lot to you? Listening to things that you don't immediately like can help create a better idea for yourself of who you are as a musician, as an artist, and also as a person, hopefully. Thomas Stevens writes, what is the music at the beginning and end of the video? So I just released my gig vlog mixtape volume one on Bandcamp, which is a collection of about five songs that I've used in my past gig vlogs. I write all the music that I use for the videos on my channel and the music that I just released in this gig vlog mixtape, you can use in your videos too, because they're all Creative Commons licensed. Just make sure to credit me and also make sure that whatever you're doing, you're not selling, non-commercial, but go nuts. I specifically made sure to release everything so that you can use it. Just credit me. You don't even need to ask me but it would be cool if you sent me anything that you end up using my music for, because that would be fun to check out. Thomas Hawkinson writes, So I realize that an important part of being a composer is to get your name out there for people to see what you are doing. I've been thinking more and more lately of streaming my music creation process on places like Twitch and YouTube, not only as a way to share my name, but as a way to force myself to compose. This is risky, though, because I know that some people are wary of sharing their music before it's even done, but Ben Levin does a great job at doing it on his channel. 
Thoughts? So I'm going to answer your question with a question. And the question that I'm answering your question with is actually a question that you can answer any question with. And that question is, what would Miles Davis do? Now, why am I talking about Miles Davis? Well, Miles Davis was at the vanguard of basically every development in jazz music for half of a century. He was an innovator of bebop in the 1940s, as well as hard bop in the 50s, free jazz in the 60s, fusion in the 70s, more fusion in the 1980s up until his death in 1991. He was kind of like just at the forefront of everything. There's really no other musical figure quite like Miles Davis. To do what Miles Davis did would be like if the Rolling Stones came out with like a trap album now and it was actually pretty good and everybody was excited to hear the Rolling Stones trap album. That's kind of like how Miles Davis reacted to every new development in music as the decades progressed. So I'm asking this question, what would Miles Davis do? Because it's an important question to ask of anybody. Right now I'm a YouTube content creator and that's great and that's working out for me. And you know, a lot of musicians are aiming to get put on like Spotify playlists, but like five years from now, the entire landscape's gonna be quite different. And I think the landscape, and you can quote me on this, is going to shift more and more towards live streaming. I can already kind of see the writing on the wall with a service like Twitch, which is now actively courting musicians to do live streams and show the behind the scenes of like the creative process for writing and recording and all that good stuff. And I can definitely see the resistance to that, not just from the idea that people might steal ideas, but mainly the idea that when you're a musician and when you're recording and when you're composing, you wanna show the world your end product because that's the thing that will communicate the idea from you to them and something that you'll be proud of. You don't necessarily wanna show all of the failures that created that product and all of the dead ends, all the things that aren't communicating your idea as like clearly as you want to. So the live streaming thing, I mean, I guess it will take a while to really like figure out for musicians. And if you see on Twitch, it's not a lot of people composing things behind the scenes because honestly, at the end of the day, Everything that you see and consume online is entertainment in one way or another. And the behind the scenes process for composing in a live stream, unedited, unfiltered sort of thing is just not that entertaining. If you go on Twitch right now, it's a lot of like uh, request channels, which is much more entertaining, quite frankly, than the boring behind the scenes of composing. So it's going to be an interesting sort of transition to the live streaming model. I'm not sure if everybody is going to jump ship immediately, and it's going to be interesting to see how it changes. So thank you for your question. Alexander Burns writes, I've hit a brick wall in terms of furthering my knowledge of jazz harmony. I don't really know where to go with what I've learned. I'd really like to get better at arranging, reharmonizing, and composing. Do you have any recommendations of books or resources that might help me get out of this rut? So I get asked this question all the time and it's very difficult to answer it because me as a person on the other end of a camera, I can't, I can't know. I can't know you. I can't know your experiences. I can't know why you're in a rut. I can't know why you're feeling not inspired and uninspired non-inspired is not a word. Anyway, a person that can help you is somebody who can work with you one-on-one, -on -one, a teacher basically, or a friend, somebody who can say, hey, check this stuff out, man. I know you haven't checked this out yet. That's the limitations of a YouTube channel. I can just give you information, but maybe that information isn't the right information that you need to hear at this point in time. What I can tell you, and I know this is not particularly intellectually stimulating, but it is a cure-all for any time that I'm feeling uninspired. I can tell you to just try learning more music learning how to play more music. Try and really focus in on learning songs, especially jazz songs, because it seems like you really are into jazz and jazz harmony, jazz composition. Learn songs. Learning repertoire, learning songs, learning just to play things is at least a way of making sure that you're working, you're doing something, you're putting in time and energy on your instrument. So even though you might not feel like you're growing, you will be because any time that you spend putting time in your instrument is time that you're spending growing. So yes, this answer might not be intellectually stimulating. I might not be able to give you the key that you need at this point in your life because I'm not a private teacher. I don't know you that well and I just can't do it from right here. But I can say that learning music and playing music and making sure to do that religiously, doing it every day is a way to get better and become a better musician. So yeah. Hopefully, hopefully you can use that advice to escape your rut. So thank you for your question. Anton Kurtikov writes, Question for the next Q&A. Do you have any general tips for notating rhythms? As I'm writing more and more and hoping to get live musicians to play the music, I'm beginning to realize the importance of not making their eyes bleed. I was always told to notate the third beat of the measure, but how would that work in odd time signatures? Same general principles? So I'm going to answer this question with a, a little bit of the same sort of idea as the last question. To get better at writing music, you need to get better at reading music. So try and read as much music as you possibly can 
can. Become a really good sight reader. The reason why you do this is to understand better the language that you're trying to use to communicate to your musicians. You can't expect a musician that you're giving music to to really appreciate what it is that you're doing unless you appreciate what it is that you're doing from their perspective. So what this means is just start grabbing pe start grabbing pieces of music and just start reading it. Just read, play it, even if it's crappy, it doesn't really matter. What you're trying to do is you're trying to internalize how the music was set on the page. I know that's not particularly actionable advice, at least in the short term. I mean, it will definitely help in the long term, but that's definitely how I got better at writing music. I got better at reading music first, and then I knew what I wanted to see in my parts. If you want something more specific, maybe check out this book, which is Music Notation, Preparing Squirts and Parts by Matthew Nichol and Richard Grudzinski, which is a Fun word to say, Grudzinski, Grudzinski. I read that at Berkeley. There's also Behind Bars by Elaine Gould. I heard that's really good. But to answer your odd time signature question, definitely make sure that whatever the subdivision the music is that you're supposed to be feeling is reflected in the parts. So if you're supposed to be feeling something like this, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, don't notate it like this. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. It kind of goes contrary to how the music is actually supposed to be felt. Make sure you can always visualize the subdivision because anytime you have any sort of meter, you can subdivide and you're supposed to subdivide. That's how people actually feel the music. So thank you for your question. And I would really strongly encourage you to read more music if you want to write sheet music for other people to read. Desconcerto writes, there's no rules theory. Use whatever chords you want. Make up your own chords. Play any notes you want. Come up with new genres. The sky's the limit. Yeah, I guess we could say that's true. And if we're going to read from the Holy Book of Theory, Vincent Persichetti's 20th Century Harmony, we would find, <clears throat> any tone can succeed any other tone. Any tone can sound simultaneously with any other tone or tones, and any group of tones can be followed by any other group of tones, just as any degree of tension or nuance can occur in any medium under any kind of stress or duration. You might notice that I have annotated this passage like this. But even though the sentiment of the comment and the Vincent Persichetti is essentially the same, Vincent Persichetti backs it up with an entire book of incredibly useful and practical tips for composing things that you can actually do, things that you can actually learn, trying to understand music on its own terms and trying to figure out how people achieved certain effects. When somebody approaches this book wanting to learn something, they will. When somebody approaches this comment wanting to learn something, they won't. And this is why I feel like this sentiment most of the time is absolutely useless because there's nothing backing it up. You can't actually learn anything from it. It's almost tautological. It's something that can't be falsified. Yeah, congratulations, you can do whatever you want, but what do I want? How do I actually do anything? And when you're trying to learn something, as many people in music are actually trying to do, they're trying to get better at something, this is not what they want to hear. They want to hear, how do I learn and try and achieve the sound in my head better? What sorts of tools can I actually use to achieve this? These are the things that you would actually try and apply. Put it this way, and I hate to get this crass, but would somebody actually pay you to teach them that information? Probably not. They don't really care to hear that information. That's not useful to them. When I'm trying to do my How to Not Suck at Music series, I'm trying to give actual practical advice, something that somebody in theory would pay for, in theory. Maybe it's not always going to be the best advice and maybe I'm not the best teacher for them, but it's always in good faith. It's something that's difficult to translate into the YouTube medium because people want to hear things that are reassuring to their own worldview and the idea that somebody might critique something that they like is not particularly reassuring to that worldview, especially coming from somebody like me who comes off as fairly smug in any of his videos, and I totally understand why that is. I, that's just me, so sorry guys. I'm still definitely gonna be doing the series, but it was a little bit of a wake-up call to me, so I'm gonna sort of tweak some things in future episodes, so anyway. Pat Bauman writes, I don't like your curtains. Sorry, um, I apologize. I'll get better curtains for future videos. Um, because that's really what people want to see in Adam Neely's channel. His curtains. Vincenzo Frosolone writes, what would you recommend to somebody who wants to compose video essays such as yours? Thank you. So I love watching video essays. It's kind of an interesting new, almost art form that has come from the medium of online video. And you know, I definitely watch a lot of essays on like art and like film theory. I've learned a lot from like Every Frame of Painting is one and like Nerd Writer does great ones. Austin McConnell's another one. But if you want to like create video essays for yourself, make sure that you really write a tight script. Like, make sure that every word and every sentence is exactly where it needs to be in order to argue a coherent thesis. Because honestly, a video essay is just the same thing 
as an essay that you would write for school. You're trying to argue a point through research. So that brings me to my second point is make sure that you have researched the hell out of whatever subject that it is that you're going to be talking about. Really know your stuff. People will react better if you actually know what it is that you're talking about. And chances are you're going to know what you're talking about a little bit more if you are really passionate about your subject. So write a good script, research it, be passionate about it. And uh, yeah, good luck. Zelchko Rocky writes, I hope I pronounced that relatively correctly, but probably not. Hey Adam, I noticed that you commonly refer to the title band leader. Is this kind of role division often in the New York music scene? A better question would be if this is the only case in which the music is performed in the New York scene. Are you a band leader in some of your projects? So sometimes people have this idea of bands as sort of a musical democracy, where the whole creative decision-making process is collectivized to one degree or another, where everybody has equal input on songwriting or decision-making processes when it comes to like gigs, what gigs to take. And everything is a consensus. Everybody comes to a consensus. Now the problem is, is that it gets a little bit poisonous when some people want to do certain things and other people want to do other things and it is held to a vote and some people are outvoted. And the thing is, that poisoned atmosphere has no place in the world of professional music because professional music is a job. It's a profession. And what job have you ever had where you didn't have a boss or a manager? Very few jobs, I would think. And working music and professional music, a job needs to be done now, and a band leader is the person that makes it happen. There is no room for hurt feelings. You just need to do your job and do it now. For example, a band leader might write the music or organize the music or arrange the music for, say, like a jazz quartet gig at a restaurant. And say maybe the drummer gets food poisoned poisoning an hour before the gig, the band leader is going to be the person that finds the new drummer and makes sure that they know the music so that they show up to the gig prepared to play. There's no argument, there's no decision-making process, there's just the band leader and the people that they have hired to do a gig. You could also call a band leader a musical director, or if you're in the classical world, the conductor. But in most situations, I really appreciate there being one person being the creative force and the decision-making force behind a particular musical project. I would say that I'm the band leader of my project Sungazer with Sean Crowder because I'm doing most of the booking and I'm writing the music and producing the music. And I'm also band leader of my new project called Adam Neely's Jazz School. We're doing our debut concert at Rockwood Music Hall, stage two, 7 p.m. on March 1st. So come check us out in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. You won't be disappointed. There will be lots of crazy music happening. So thank you so much for watching this episode of Question and Answer Time. I'll see you next time.